I love people. I'd love to meet them all. Yeah, that's the thing about Iowa. You tend to meet the same kind of person all over and over and over again. Uh, hello, Rock Hard Caucus listeners. This is a very special episode that we have for you today. Um, we have, I'm sure if, if you're familiar with our program, there's somebody that uh, is often a subject of ridicule among us and our peers. Uh, we spent months and years criticizing, making fun of this person. And um, over the, the past few days, I've come to understand i mean i guess i always knew this but there really is a human being on the other side of all of these uh these arguments these these flame wars there's a human being on the other side of the screen and uh not only that uh, our elected officials are in fact human beings and sometimes it's easy to forget that because you know they do hold some power and you know i <sighs> I've had a change of heart, I think. I think up until now, I felt that anybody in a position of power is a worthy target. You can say whatever you want about them, and it doesn't matter. It doesn't make you a bad person to to relentlessly mock a figure of authority. But now, now I've been speaking with a figure of authority. We've sort of been making some arrangements behind the scenes. And uh, we're welcoming to the show for the first time the only statewide elected democrat in iowa our uh, state auditor rob sand rob welcome to the show well justin thank you for having me it is such an honor and a privilege to see you today uh, i guess i should have addressed you as mr sand first is it okay if i call you rob oh I, w- I would like for everyone to call me rob after all just like you said i'm a person i'm a human being i'm you know actually i'm actually a uh, talking to you right now from the citywide cleaners in city rapids mm. that's right the one of my favorite places to go to they have such a wonderful sign i love to take pictures of that sign i've done it several times on my twitter just one of my favorite places and and it, and it just shows that i'm just like you i'm just a real person with real needs like the desire to take a picture of a sign yeah, I have seen that they've had some clever uh, puns on their sign recently. Why have you been spending time in Cedar Rapids? That's not where you live or, or work, as far as I know. Well, sometimes I just like to be among the common people, you know? I like to travel around and just sort of talk to people. You know, I don't... When I'm here in, in Des Moines and I'm here at the office of the city or the, or the state auditor, I don't get a chance to talk to normal people. But when I go out to a normal person place like Cedar Rapids, which I'm, I'm led to believe is full of normal people, that's what mm-hmm. I do. Yeah, I would say that Cedar Rapids is absolutely the home of normal Iowans. Uh, every every co-host of our show uh, grew up in Cedar Rapids, and we are all excessively normal. And I think we are, we're kind of like the model of what an Iowan should be, as are you, Miss, uh, Rob. Oh, yes, Justin. You are so profoundly normal. Nothing about you is abnormal in the slightest. <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that. Coming from you, it means a lot, uh, Rob. So I had one major question that I, I wanted to address while we were recording. You know, you went on the Moderate Party podcast after ignoring... Well, really, like, you had a press... Like, a PR person reach out to us to ask to come on the show... I said yes, and then never heard back. And then I saw you went on this other show, the Moderate Party podcast. I figured that maybe you, we have a reputation that you don't appreciate. You didn't want to associate with us. So my big question for you, Rob, is uh, what made you change your mind about coming on our show? Well, first off, I would like to give a big shout out to the Moderate Party podcast. Um, I am, of course, a very strong moderate. I believe that the status quo is great. Things are wonderful, especially here in Iowa. There is nothing wrong with how things are going in Iowa. Nothing bad has been happening for the past several weeks or months. So moderation and the status quo are just things that I adore. So a a podcast like theirs that would bring me on, fantastic. But I'm here today, Justin, to address the allegations that have come up recently. Um, 
on the Modern Rip podcast, um, I don't know if it was your podcast or their podcast or somebody, but they, they seemed to uh, use some sort of filter on my voice that made me sound like I was uh, had a deeper voice. No, no. I want to assure everyone this is actually what I sound like, and this is actually how I talk, and this is actually what I what it looks like when I say things. This is just how I am. I am not some sort of deep-voiced person. I don't have a calm, a soothing voice. I talk precisely like this. Yes, I can assure everyone listening now, I am not doing any sort of audio processing. Um, and, and actually, you know, this isn't even going through a computer. Uh, Rob and I are sitting across from each other. I am recording this directly to tape, actually. Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. We're here at the Citywide Cleaners. Um, Justin is going to do some wonderful um, audio audio jutsu to get rid of the sounds of the dryers and the, and the washers. It'll be just fantastic, but he won't put any filters on. No, he's an honorable fellow like me, Rob Sand. That's right, yep. This is Rob's real voice, and I will not be uh, altering it in any way because it's a nice voice. It's great to hear from uh, a state official who sounds just like this. Absolutely. And it, it is great to hear from me because the people of Iowa really do appreciate me. After all, as you said, I am the only statewide Democrat in office right now. So you know that people love me after that. <laughs> there i've literally one note it's about come <laughs> all right well, quick we'll, one yeah yeah we'll get to that um <laughs> uh, welcome back everybody to a very special episode of speed freak read speak i believe this is our ninth episode our ninth installment of speed freak read speak which is as you all know everyone listening to this has listened to every episode so far of this series i'm sure this is a podcast where uh, my friend Tony and I read Sonic the Hedgehog comics and then talk to each other about them. And uh, it, specifically the Archie comics series Sonic the Hedgehog, which began in the early 90s. How's it going, Tony? I'm doing well, thanks. I, uh, I was a little, I've been interrupted by cats, so I lost my train of thought, but I am excited to be here. It's a special episode today that I'm an honor to be a part of. Yeah, we um so we've got like a a long list of all these Sonic comics in order and the plan at the beginning was to try to kind of go through them in order. Um we're still very close to the beginning, much closer to the the first issue than the last issue. Um because we release one of these every few months. Uh sometimes we take an entire year off, so we we make slow progress reading these. It's um, it's a lot of hard work. Um, I need to sleep pretty much like most of the day after I do one of these episodes to regain my strength and energy. Um, but it's worth it to bring people to commentary that they deserve to hear about these. Yeah, it's really exhausting. And like, you really don't want to read these on your own without us to guide you through, uh, because the themes are extremely deep and complicated and it need you, I mean, ultimately it would be smart for like universities to offer graduate programs in Sonic the Hedgehog comic book studies uh, so that more people would be able to help uh, the public, the the common man, get their way through these texts. It, it would broaden public consciousness, but you can't just jump right into it either. You got to start off with like your Ulysses and stuff, just like less thematically dense stories um, kind of brush up your chops from there before you get to this. Mm -hmm. Well, today we are uh, going back to January of 1995. Uh, there were actually two Sonic uh, releases that month. I believe uh, issue, yeah, issue 18 came out, but uh, also a very special issue came out, which I'm pulling up now for you. Uh, there it is. This is... um. Sonic the Hedgehog in your face. A special issue. Uh, number one, collector's edition. <laughs> it's a giant size, 48-page, one-shot special. 
Uh, we're looking at the cover now. I, basically, what happened earlier today was I presented Tony with these two choices. Should we read number 18 or should we read Sonic the Hedgehog in your face? And I think you liked this cover better. I did. It was, um, it kind of perturbs me on a very deep level. It's, um, I don't know, it makes me feel things. And I, I think that's what art's purpose is to provoke and investigate those feelings. And uh, yeah. I feel a lot looking at this. For anyone who maybe is not looking at this along with us, um, Sonic the Hedgehog appears to be a giant. Well, it is a giant size 48 page issue. So maybe that's the bit there is that he's giant sized. Uh, but he also has a, there's a roller coaster coming out of his mouth. That's more important, I think. <laughs> yeah, it's not like my instinct was to say that he's vomiting, but he looks too comfortable. Um, I think that's part of what's disturbing about it is like, if I picture a smaller roller coaster coming out of my mouth, I'd be terrified. That would bother me. And if my friends yeah. were riding, riding the car on the tracks coming out of my mouth. And insulting me on their way out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Sally and Tails are riding the Sonic Express out of Sonic's giant mouth. And Sally, with furrowed brow, uh, says, I've always said Sonic has a big mouth, but that's ridiculous. Yeah, it's, I assume he's in pain as this is happening. <laughs> I assume it's like, um, I watched a clip from Batman once. It was like some kind of child painted like the Joker, who was clearly in a lot of pain, but he kept oh, laughing. Um, yeah, that's from the uh, Return of the Joker, the Batman Beyond movie. Okay, I, I could see, I don't know which one it's from. from. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I feel like they got that from this, when Sonic's clearly in pain and terror. Yep, this came as, first. yeah. <laughs> and thank god they don't show us the other side of him the back of his head where i assume oh, i don't the, i don't want to know because we only see the track coming out of his mouth we don't see how it got into his body and there's a lot of track like in the background so i assume that's just going in and out of his brain yeah true horror comes from implication so i think they did a really good balancing act of presenting something that on its face is just a terror but what's worse is what it implies yeah Okay, well, let's let's open this up. Yeah, let's get in. Yeah. All right. Uh, there's the credits page. Uh, we got in the background there just a detail that um, is always nice to see. Uh, Sonic's head from a front angle always looks very weird. Yeah. Yeah, I'm glad they got that in there. There's at least one other instance of that in this book, so I'll point it out again later. All right, so... <laughs> Um, the first story in this uh, issue takes up like I think half or maybe more of the 48 pages is uh, part three of a Princess Sally focused story, which I guess was called Princess Sally's Crusade. Although I don't know that she was, you know, killing infidels in the story. I don't know, but I missed the second part. And it seems like a lot happened in that second part. Right, we're reading part three of three, and we skipped part two because we didn't read Sonic the Hedgehog number 18. Uh, but we did read number one in Sonic the Hedgehog number 17, part one of uh, Princess Sally's Crusade, which, if I recall, uh, it involved her finding an orb. That was about it, yeah. She was like, looking at the stars and was like, what about life? And then there was an orb. Right. So something happened between finding the orb and now where she is like doing martial arts training with Sonic and wearing a very unsettling mask. Yeah, it's fucking it's, <laughs> it's supposed to be like a hockey mask. Or I don't know if that's like some kind of fencing mask. Uh, she looks like the Phantom of the Opera. Yeah. I mean, they don't have um, uh, swords, so I don't know if they're fencing. Yeah, no. But it they, is they that kind of are. mask. Yeah. What? So her eyes poke through, but what's really bothering me is the tiny mouth hole. The mouth hole that makes it look like she has tiny little teeth and she's kind of doing like a weird smirk. <laughs> uh, yeah. God. And she wears it for the next couple pages. Um, Before, before we read the rest of this, I just want to note that this was written by Mike Kantorovich and our friend Ken Penders. And the pencils, the art was by Art Mahwini. 
Benders, of course, is the most important uh, creative force behind this. Yeah, in our time, really. Mm-hmm. All right, so she's wearing the scary mask for a couple more panels there. And then there's a flashback to the orb crashing onto the Earth. And then this is, I think, what we missed in part two. There's some old woman named Julayla. Yeah, she's she's dying, apparently. She died of old age or something. Yeah. Uh, Sally visited her on her deathbed or something. And then um, Julayla left. She's, like, bequeathing her hoard to Sally. And uh, most importantly, this is explains the origins of Sally's vest. I know you are all wondering. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I was wondering, like, why she's finding it now. Is this like a flashback comic? Where does this factor in? Yeah, was she... I, I guess I wasn't paying close enough attention to her attire. I know that her, like, fur color changed and her hair color changed. Um, but I think she's been nude aside from her boots up until now. Oh, okay. Maybe I just inserted the vest in my previous memory. I assume she always had it. Right. The vest becomes like a, a, a constant of her, uh, her wardrobe going forward. But I didn't do enough. I didn't go back and research to see uh, if the vest has made an appearance prior to now. Uh, yeah, I might just be misremembering. Anyway, she still doesn't have pants. So. No. Uh, she she found the vest in uh, Julela's hope chest, which she was supposed to receive on her wedding day, Sally's wedding day. Well, so that's her the... wedding vest or her marriage <laughs> vest. Or it's like a wedding ring for chipmunks. Right. When uh, the chipmunk royal family, uh, once they have been uh, betrothed, that's when they can start wearing clothes. It's some sort of like Harry Potter thing, I think. Probably, it's similar, yeah. similar to the slave elves. Yeah, the anti-Semitic like <laughs> goblins or whatever. Well, the goblins are anti-Semitic. The uh, the elves are more like um, socially acceptable slavery in the Harry Potter universe. Okay, cool. <laughs> <It's> fine. <laughs> I'm not gonna interrogate that concept at all. Uh. Yeah. No one else should either. We should all just uh accept that uh that whole fictional narrative on its face and never interrogate any of it. The most important thing you can do in the world, I learned this from my parents, is just don't like just like you wouldn't kink shame, don't video game shame. If someone's <laughs> trying to game, like that's beyond reproach. Yeah, no, I mean uh, gaming is consumption, and we all know that there is no ethical consumption or any unethical consumption under exactly. capitalism. Exactly. Exactly. Can't have one without the other. <laughs> consumption is entirely separate from morality. All right. So the vest, uh, the marriage thing. Yeah, I wanted to say uh, the issue that we skipped. The cover was Sonic and Sally's wedding. So maybe they got married in between the last thing we read and now. It maybe I don't know. It'd be weird because it's like Penders and the other writers would have to agree on like what the characterization is there. Um, so right, maybe yeah. this marks the departure from like when Ken like killed somebody in real life, or maybe <laughs> like framed them so that they got fired from Archie Comics. Right, so they can stop undermining his uh, efforts to put them in a romantic relationship. Yeah, yeah. these teen teenage anthropomorphic animals. Oh, God. <laughs> this page made me very uncomfortable. <laughs> uh, so Sally's uh, is asleep, and the orb is calling to her. And, of course, they show us a panel of fully nude Sally Acorn. Well, to play devil's advocate, you just said she's been entirely <laughs> nude up until this point anyway. <laughs> but oh, the she, boots. Oh, she's, the boots, yeah. They did kind of put some detail in those feet. Um yeah. yeah, yeah, they should have blurred out the feet. She has at least three toes there. Yeah. And I shouldn't know that. They shouldn't have been allowed to print that. No, no, this is for kids. Kids shouldn't be looking at feet. <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> I do like the kind of, like, uh, the dynamic nature of this page where, like, 
there's multiple angles like and a super close up when she opens her eyes because the orb is calling to her and then it zooms out and we see her from slightly below in this this one here where she's walking towards the orb it's not bad of, of course the page where she's entirely naked is the one where they put in some artistic effort yeah you gotta go with that kind of panel not panelist but it's like three panels that still kind of have like six frames of action mm-hmm that's where you really want the viewer's attention. You gotta have, have as much real estate as you can get for uh, for that chipmunk. <laughs> okay, so the orb is talking to her. Hello, Sally. Uh, and then the orb, uh, it turns out, is a magic talking calculator. Yeah, it's a weird <laughs> cell phone kind of situation named Nicole. Right. Why is it named that? Uh, I don't believe it is explained. But it's some, yeah, some kind of cell phone named Nicole. Um, yeah, I can tell you, having read a, a stretch of these comics when I was a kid in like the hundreds, uh, Nicole is a like standby character from now on. Nicole sticks okay. around. <laughs> so this is actually important, this introduction. And um, people like all of Sally's roommates hear her speaking, talk, talking to this Game Boy. So, of course, they all amass together and all burst into a room all at once while she's fully <laughs> nude because she's talking. <laughs> we heard voices. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. And then Sonic, of course, is a, an idiot and he immediately starts shaking the talking uh, phone calculator. There, which... there are computers in this universe, to be clear. If anyone's listening to this oh, yeah. for the first time, this is not a novel thing. Yeah, there's been a lot of technology. That's a kind of a big theme, actually, is like nature versus a uh, machine. Mm. It's happening a lot. So they're certainly familiar with computers. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe we could go back. I can't remember if the animals use technology. Maybe they're like kind of Amish or something. <laughs> well, I know, you know, Tails has a plane. Rotor is always tinkering with stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that doesn't add up. Oh, there's another frontal Sonic. Yeah, yeah, there it is. (laughs) When he gets shocked. Um, I will say Sonic, I think, is a bit of a Luddite. He kind of relies entirely on speed and never uh, tech. I don't I don't know if um, because there's like so many Sonics, but one of them is like he has technology shoes and that's why he's fast. I don't know if that's this universe. I think that came up in one of these comics where his shoes are special. Or no, his shoes yeah. are like, um, he's naturally fast, but he has special shoes that can handle the speed that he runs at, I think is the canon okay. here. Okay. Yeah. So they're like, before, they were before like, you know, people started cutting corners in like the manufacturing process or something. Yeah. Higher like quality a, rubber. Like an early days Toyota of shoes. <laughs> And I was thinking um, in terms of Sonic's relationship with technology, uh, something he does a lot is jump on TV screens and destroy them. Yeah, he's been doing that consistently for decades. Yeah. He fucking hates TV, <laughs> and yet TV gives him life. <laughs> uh, so uh, Nicole, when, when Nicole is shaken by Sonic, she retaliates and uh, tries to electrocute him. And uh, so- uh, Sally is uh, upset I think at both of them for fighting. And then she needs to go on some kind of, yeah, she needs to go on an adventure to the forbidden zone, which I presume was established in part two. Maybe so. I wouldn't be surprised if they were just sort of like, yeah, this sounds menacing enough. That's where she's going. (laughs) What I liked a lot about her uh, sort of adventuring outfit is this bandana she puts on this like Rambo style thing, uh, Mm. which bandanas are supposed to like keep the sweat out of your eyes and like your hair up or something but she's using it to sort of clamp her bangs to her forehead yeah to keep them in her eyes (laughs) keep them in place right here in in front in the middle (laughs) so uh the forbidden zone is like so dangerous that even uh robotnik's robots don't go in there so it's going to be a super dangerous mission uh, Sally wanted to go by herself to not put her friends in danger, but they were like, no way, we're coming too. We love danger. 
I do kind of like that she says that not even Robotnik goes there. Like, it's supposed to say something. I feel like Robotnik doesn't really do shit anyway. He flies yeah, around he's... in a chair. Just... Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, so far he's he's been kind of characterized as like... uh, They're all sometimes afraid of him, but then every time there's a confrontation, he's kind of a coward and loses quickly. He loses extremely easily. He's so easy <laughs> to lose. Uh, something I, I started noticing here was they use a lot of like sound effect uh, words here. This is a big one. Uh, shroom as the plane flies. <laughs> yeah, I don't, they didn't want to go with just a classic zoom, but I feel like that might have made more sense than... Because now I'm just thinking about Mushroom. Right, yep. Yeah. And Mushrooms are... They're around sometimes in the Sonic stuff. There's Mushroom Hill Zone. Yeah, very prominent zone. Yeah. Huge Mushrooms. Obviously, Mushrooms are a much bigger part of the, the Mario universe. But uh, there are Mushrooms occasionally in Sonic Zones. And, and then another sound effect. Well, I guess I'm not sure if this is a sound effect. But as they... Uh, jump from the plane. They're parachuting. Uh, it says Geronimo. Yeah, it's not but, a speech bubble. It, it looks like an onomatopoeia. Like it's right. supposed to be a sound. Yeah. So as they jump out, the the sound of them parachuting is making the sound Geronimo. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So they are uh, going to sneak in uh, to the forbidden zone, and they have to get past border patrol. <laughs> topical very topical we're all talking about it folks <laughs> yeah there's there's a i think they're trying to say something here about uh the nature of uh the nations and and the empire maintaining its borders um what's interesting here is it seems you know the purpose of this border patrol is to keep to keep i guess are are these animals citizens of wherever they are right now uh good question it kind of seems up until this point i feel like robotnik's the imperial force kind of like encroaching on their land it seems like he's like oh, i mm-hmm. want to turn all the squirrels into robots or whatever so that they can run my gambling parlors or like <laughs> that's about it that's like the only <laughs> non-militaristic project he seems to have going on. Casinos. Yeah, that's really it. Uh, yeah. Okay, so yeah, you're right. He's definitely... He's building an empire and expanding his empire. So I think the animals are like indigenous to to this place. Yes, so. Although, I don't know where they are exactly right now. That was probably established in part two. Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. <laughs> But anyway, the, what I was trying to sort of uh, bring up here is that the Border Patrol is keeping them on this side of the fence. Like, they're not, they're not exactly guarding what's on the other side of the fence. They're just trying to keep the animals from going over there. Which, the other side's the forbidden zone, right? Like, they right. get through the wall? Yeah. I didn't put this together where, when I was reading it either, but I think I see where you're going. Yeah, they're trying to keep keep them in, not let them get out to the forbidden zone. Uh, I don't know. And uh, Sally's only weapon is a slingshot, which she is using to um, fire paintballs at these robots. I don't know if Sally's killed the robot yet, but a lot of these robots have been murdered up until now. I think they could have come up with better weapons. Yeah, Sonic's body is a weapon, as we've seen a time after time yeah he kind of just he kind of just spins at them and <laughs> kills them and they, easily they explode or they get dizzy <laughs> uh, you know what it happens right here actually on the next page um and again we got a lot of sound effects there's the splat of the paintballs which doesn't seem like it's really actually doing much she blinds like two of the robots but sonic's pulling way more than his own weight in this battle. Uh, the swap bots are, are shooting at him, and that makes the sound zorch. And then he uh, he buzzes at them, and it makes the sound uh, shracked. 
And then his his next move is to just run past them quickly. <laughs> he just runs away. Varoom is the sound that that makes. And then the uh, robots give up. They give up because they're like, oh, the Forbidden Zone's so dangerous. We can just let them go. Which a couple things, like I think we were kind of getting that earlier. It's just sort of like, why do they have a border wall trying to keep them out of there? If you're happy to let them go there and die anyway. Right. What was your job? Why were you doing this? And also up until this point, I feel like Robotnik's policy has kind of just sort of been like, if you don't do whatever you can to kill Sonic, I'm going to kill you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like, I feel like these robots are probably going to get killed by Robotnik. I feel like they should know that. Maybe they don't mind. Maybe they long for death. Then why not die in the Forbidden Zone? That's true. (laughs) Just uh, take a few steps that way and uh, it seems like you're destined for sudden destruction. Abandon hope all ye who enter is what the sign says. A very old timey phrase for a very modern looking sign. <laughs> ye, yeah. We don't say ye a lot anymore. All ye who enter. All right. And then uh the our heroes make it into the forbidden zone, of course, because the robots are no longer interested in stopping them. And they are so I, I wonder what you thought about this. Uh there's a another robot on the other side sort of guarding a doorway? I don't know. And um, what's the French guy's name again? Antoine. Um, yeah. So Antoine, he says, Mon Dieu, it is the Cyclops. And then what does Sonic say? Well, he gulps first. And he says it looks more like a one-eyed monster to him. Right. So <laughs> the joke they're going for is that Sonic is stupid and doesn't know what a Cyclops is. Right, but uh, one-eyed monster. <laughs> you ever heard that like before? No, <laughs> I feel to. like they know. <laughs> I mentioned. I don't know if you're going to leave that clip in of me at the start of the recording, but I I have a note for way later. I feel like they know. We'll get to that. I'll, I'll try to remember <laughs> to bring up the Cyclops towards the end. But they do another thing like this. Yeah, and uh, the two next to each other, I feel like, isn't a coincidence. Yeah, they, they got to know. Uh, again, Mike Kantorovich and Ken Penders, at least one of you is inserting adult uh, subjects into this child's comic book. I bet it was Ken. <laughs> yeah, I, was, I, I wasn't going to say it, but I, yeah, I think we know who it was. <laughs> All right, so they get in a fight with this uh, robot Cyclops. Uh, lots, lots of other uh, sound effects such as thwack and thwalk and thoom. Oh shit! And we're interrupted by a very cool piece, <laughs> piece of art. <laughs> There's a like a two page two. Or it was in the sideways, so I had to I had to rotate it. But um, yeah, very cool art from uh, Patrick Spaziante. I never knew how to say that guy's name, but uh, he maybe like a spots. I don't know. Spaziante? Yeah, maybe. Yeah, the tsk, 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 like a pizza Z. <laughs> exactly, yeah, uh, manja. But I know him from, uh, he does like a lot of covers for this series going forward. And you can see why. The talent is on full display here. <laughs> Mostly in that front angle of Sonic's head again. The front angle. It's a bold angle. It's a bold angle to take for Sonic. Mm-hmm. Okay, the story continues. Um, I love the way that Sonic defeated the Cyclops monster. Yeah, same way you kind of defeat like a a paranoid dog, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, he just stands still. He, uh, you know, just stop. If you just stop moving, the Cyclops defeats itself. I kind of like, so it's supposed to be like it's a motion sensor, so they stand still and it deactivates. It's like, all right, so what activates it into motion sensing mode? Right, because you did move after that, and it didn't wake back up. So Yeah, and you moved into the layer, so was it like, what, <laughs> what activated it in the first place? Yeah, it's got, so the, it's got a manual on, but then a motion off. 
So a lack of motion turns it off, but then you have to turn it on. It's sort of a, I don't know, catch-22. <laughs> yeah. Also, is this a Robotnik Cyclops? I didn't even think it, it's a robot. I don't think but, it's his. So someone else put this robot here. Yeah, somebody in the Forbidden Zone. Uh, well, not not only made a Cyclops, but also a griffin that breathes fire. And, yeah, uh, <laughs> I thought it was interesting that you got a griffin breathing fire. So I was like, oh yeah, it's usually a dragon. That's kind of cool that they went with a griffin. <laughs> and then, uh, well, there is a dragon later that does not breathe fire right after. That, that was kind of my thing. I was just like, oh, why is there's like a dragon here now? Like, why the fuck we do? Well, I guess maybe technically it's a hydra, but I feel like that's a subcategory of dragon. It's a super dragon looking hydra, too. Like, it's yeah. green. A lot, of, a lot of hydras look kind of like gatorish. This is definitely more of a dragon type. Yeah, super dragony. It's got like the the scaled front thing. Mm. Hydras sometimes are snaky, I guess. Uh, Too, yeah. Yeah, I do want to mention that they defeated the uh, Griffin by tails pulling a sword out of a thing. <laughs> and yeah, that he just... pulls the Excalibur. Which I thought he was going to slay it, but it's like, no, it just completed a circuit. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, wait, so the... I guess the Griffin's a robot too. Yeah, yeah. And okay. Honestly, this is a much more advanced looking robot than Robotnik's work. You know, no, yeah, like, way better. It doesn't even look like a robot, <laughs> it just looks like a real Griffin, a living biological creature. Uh, and the thwack as Tails pulls the sword out is very cool. And he looks kind of like surprised, like shocked that he was able to pull it out. Very emotive moment for him. All right, so yeah, we can go to the uh, two-headed dragon. Uh, it's the classic, uh, you know, two guards guarding two doorways and one only lies, one only tells the truth. Yeah, and this is what I what I messaged you about when we first talked about this. I think I might be incredibly dumb. <laughs> but I feel like the solution did not make sense at all. I yeah, I mean I think that the solution she chooses is supposed to be like the correct answer to this riddle, which is that you you can ask either head to tell your question. Okay. <laughs> so one guard can only tell the truth, one can only lie and the doors they're guarding, one is the way you want to go, the other one is certain death. Okay? And the way that she solves this puzzle is to ask one of the heads, what would the other head say if I asked which is the correct door? And then you just go to the opposite one. That's supposed to be the solution. It, <laughs> it, I, like, I read this over like five times and I guess... I'm going to read this out. Uh, yeah. yeah. I don't know if people are going to listen to this. <laughs> if people want to like fucking leave a voicemail, you can tell me to like explain this to me. But here's what she says. If he was the head that tells the truth, he would have told us truthfully that the other head would have lied. On the other hand, if he was the head that lies, then obviously it would still be the door on the right, which turns out to be the correct door because the head told... The dragon told them to go to the left. But wouldn't, if you were the lying head, wouldn't you say the other head would lie? The other head would lie and then tell you <laughs> that door? Like, there's a way to lie around that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah, I don't feel like this is like a magic bullet. Or I guess, I, I don't know if that's the right idiom to use there, but uh, I don't feel like there is one, like, bulletproof solution to that problem because like one one of the heads lies means that it's a deceitful head and it should be capable of deceit at the highest level <laughs> yeah that's what i would imagine and then the other thing too is just like the two heads look at each other and they laugh so like they must have like a good relationship. I don't think their motives are different. It's just one yeah. lies and one tells the truth, but they're not like, like why would the head that always tells the truth volunteer extra information 
to help you on your way. Yeah, and the fact that they're laughing together uh, sort of, you know, you go into this thinking that uh, lying versus telling the truth, there's some moral quality to either of those. Like, telling the truth is good, lying is bad. But then you see these two, this two-headed dragon where one of them lies, one tells the truth, but they're still, like, partners in this, clearly. You would think they would be ethically complete opposites and not you know chilling having fun together and it makes you question the whole thing like well is it always good to tell the truth is it always bad to lie is there really any sort of moral judgment on either option what's the point of any of this yeah what's the point who are they here like is this another robot are they like (laughs) paid are they paid by like i don't know the orb corporation that is was set up as like a trust by the chipmunk game boy fucking <laughs> that, that's the other thing too i'm, I'm struggling here because we didn't read part two and then there's something going on with time and like <laughs> i don't know sally went back in time and made herself a game boy to be her best friend <laughs> and it's like did, it's, it's, did, did, did they did the people who did that did they put the dragon here right we don't actually <laughs> we don't get an answer as to whether the dragon is also a robot now that you mention it. No, we don't. I want to say yes, just actually no, I don't want to say yes. <laughs> I don't fucking know, dude. Well, that that does kind of make it easier for me anyway, like the moral question. Like if you're simply programmed to tell the truth or programmed to lie, then there's no moral question at all. Like you just that's have way, to follow that's the That's why I looked at it from the beginning. Yeah. Like when they were explaining the rules, I was like, one lies, one tells the truth. They don't necessarily have a moral compulsion in the matter. And that didn't come to my mind until she was like, oh, the other, the one telling the truth would say the other one would lie. And it's like, what reason would they have? Yeah. Because by that, when you're saying that, that means the one that you asked was the liar. But wouldn't the liar say the other one would lie? I don't know. Yeah, it's it's hard to follow, but it's easier for me to accept if I just if I just say, you know, they they're following their programming and they have no other choice in the matter, and then I stop thinking mm. about it and move on. <laughs> yeah, that's basically where I was at. And then the other thing too is that the the dragon says, All right, truly you are wise beyond your years. So if it's if that was the dragon that was telling the lie, <laughs> then that was a lie. He's calling her a dumbass, yeah. <laughs> her a dumbass. <laughs> but she was right. So that means that would have to be true. Yeah. Well, you know what's <laughs> funny? The next page, Sonic is like, how did you know which head was which? And Sally just said, yeah, I don't know. I don't know either, actually. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that's helpful. I did, yeah, you know... It. I did think about this a little further, and I, I went to riddlesbrainteasers.com to see what other people thought about this puzzle. Because this is like, you know, something I've encountered before. I'm sure you've you've read stories where this happens. Oh, yeah. Uh, there's 55 comments on this one on riddlesbrainteasers.com. And, for example, uh, this person V said, but how would you know which guard told the truth and which one was lying if you could only ask one question to one guard? <laughs> Totally not understanding the premise. Uh, here, the, Haley Doings offers an alternate solution. Ask, do both of the doors lead to the exit? The liar would say yes, and it's pretty obvious which door to go through after that. Is it, though? Because you, you didn't even... <laughs> one's going to say yes and one's going to say no, but you used up your question. <laughs> so obviously You're... this is a very challenging... Yeah. Thing to a lot of people. <laughs> and then uh, uh, this RJ Savvy, I'm just going to give you one more example of a proposed solution. Just ask, what color are my eyes? The liar will lie, and you'd know or be told the truth, and you'd also know. Simple, even if it isn't the correct answer. I don't. Again, we're not <laughs> trying to identify the guard. <laughs> You still don't know which door is which. Um, so you, 
you ask what color your eyes are, then you flip a coin and just go through the door. And if you die, you die. <laughs> okay. Maybe, uh, what if you just open the door and didn't go through it? You just open both doors and look into them. There you, you go. You don't even ask the guards. Oh, that's a hack. <laughs> The hack is that you don't have to just, like, run through every door you open like Kramer. Yeah, exactly. You can wait. You can observe your surroundings. Yeah, you've you've ascended. You're seeing the puzzle from above. You're not stuck inside <laughs> the puzzle anymore. <laughs> I just, I don't know why I had this thought, but I was thinking about Kramer and impulsivity, and then I thought about, like, something <laughs> he has in common with PewDiePie, and about how, like, <laughs> that was, like, not thinking. Um, yeah, Kramer would fucking die Absolutely. in this scenario. Yeah. Impulsive. Deserve it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. So they get past all these puzzles and they find another chest, which is apparently uh, a miniature version of Julayla's hope chest. Julayla was the chipmunk who's dying. Uh, this lady's got so many chests, some of them hidden behind many uh, riddles and puzzles. In the chest is a map. Or scroll? Yeah, Wait, it's, he... Sonic's a fucking idiot. <laughs> like, <laughs> what, it's like, what's so important about a piece of paper? Dude, you fucking read it. That has words on it. <laughs> you dumb asshole. <laughs> I don't know that... Do they tell us what... I don't think they do. No. It's it, it's just like so, a f final testament of Julela. And then the we flash to the future. Of, yeah. Yeah, is it that Julela was Sally? in the future and she oh, was I like even... I, i'm gonna have my servant rotor build me a game boy to send back into the past and then she also goes into the past and dies <laughs> <laughs> let me go back and see what she looked like we did get a glimpse of her i it mean it's, like she could be yeah it's possible who the fuck rosie is by the way Oh yeah, Rosie's <laughs> that lady with the white hair who's maybe like a servant of the royal family or something. I'm sure Rosie was introduced in part two as well. Okay, so flashing to the future. This was a this is a very Penders moment. Uh all right, so these little guys here, it's not just smaller Sally and Sonic, it's actually their children. Okay, and then her dad's alive, so she sent the Game Boy into the past so that she might save her dad, but her dad's alive in the Game Boy future? Yeah. Uh, so, in this, in this glimpse of the future, Sonic and Sally are wearing crowns, so presumably they are now the king and queen of the... It's not the Mushroom Kingdom, it's the... Not whole it's not forest. the animal king. Uh, <laughs> I want to say the animal king. <laughs> <laughs> they are the top of the food chain now, and uh, oh, tails has glasses. By the way, old tails. Tails just looks the same age, except he's wearing glasses. <laughs> yeah, uh, bunny no longer has robot parts, and she is also nude, but it's censored by this dialogue <laughs> box. <laughs> I only got so many from the publishers. <laughs> like tenders, yeah. we're only giving you one naked animal for this issue <laughs> stop talking to us <laughs> and it, uh, okay so the smaller versions of Sally and Sonic are the children of Sally and Sonic and rather than them having strange chipmunk hedgehog hybrids they just have one of each a chipmunk yeah. and a hedgehog so their male offspring come out as hedgehogs the female come out as chipmunks or something they gotta have I a third one and see maybe, what happens. Maybe chipmunks, maybe chipmunks are exclusively female in this universe, but then the dad's right there. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> also, how narcissistic is it to give your kids the same exact haircuts you have? Right, to, and they just they look, they look like clones, honestly. Yeah. And the baby Sally has pants, purple pants. I think we saw pants before. Well, she's a child. You can't put that in there. That may have been something we talked about on the last episode. <laughs> Sally's pants, her child pants. She might have, yeah, maybe. I think I vaguely recall that. Rotor's wearing like uh, some kind of robe or like suit jacket with no pants, which I feel like makes it worse than just being outright naked. Yeah, it's like a long, it's like a trench coat 
looking thing. Yeah. <laughs> but it's just short enough that you can picture what it looks like on the other side of that stool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hopefully no one's under that table. So it's revealed that Rotor, future old Rotor, he invented Nicole, the talking calculator Game Boy. And the orb that uh, crashed to the earth that Sally discovered, that was actually a time travel machine. A time machine is a shorter way of saying that. And, and it also, sh- she says that Nicole is destroyed in, in some battle at some point between the orb crashing and this future moment. So this is Nicole's birth and her death occurs before her birth. Yeah, I, I have a hard time with whatever they're doing here. <laughs> they're definitely complicating stuff uh, to probably an unnecessary degree for a Sonic the Hedgehog comic book. Yeah, and I don't know if it's that they didn't think it through or if I just can't think enough. Yeah, there's, you know, there's a point where you think long and hard enough about a Sonic the Hedgehog comic and then you have to just take a step back and realize yeah. that it's, it's not worth it. <laughs> I mean, this this is what I'm doing today. I was cleaning the house. <laughs> <laughs> and you were like, hey, you want to do one of these? I'm like, all right, yeah, I'll do that instead. This is just my life for the next 24 <laughs> hours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, obviously, that point at which you give up for you and me is uh, much further down the line than it would be for most people, I think. Yeah. Well, I mean, this is what we're here to contribute to the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, They don't explain why the calculator's name is Nicole, unless I missed something. But uh, Rotor just decides, this is Nicole. Mm. It's a talking palm pilot. Turns out to be someone who died in a war or something, and it's like a big heartfelt thing. It might be. It might be. It might be. And the thing is, okay, this is fucking weird. They, They invent Nicole in the future and then send her back in time, and then they all know Nicole this whole time. And then there's an absence of Nicole for a while, and then Rotor invents Nicole, who he had already met. But he wasn't able to just, you know, recreate her instantly. There's a period of time after her destruction with no Nicole. Right. And it's like, maybe at some point there was a Rotor that was the original Rotor to create Nicole. But is that a constantly recurring thing through time? Or is that like a parallel universe thing where Nicole was created in one universe and then every time it gets sent back in time, that's a new universe? Oh. Maybe. Yeah. I'm I'm sure they thought it through that much. They will probably explain to us the mechanics of time travel in this universe. I'm sure that we will get an answer to these questions. Yeah, because eventually the the hat guys, the tall and skinny guy, they're going to be back. Yeah, Yeah, um, horizontal and vertical were their names. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Okay, so um, the the dying words of Julayla, the old dying chipmunk, her final words were, to thine own self be true. I don't know why she quoted Hamlet on her deathbed. But this was very meaningful to Sally. <laughs> yeah. Maybe Sally's never seen Hamlet. So she's like, damn, Jalela thought of that all by herself. Smart. She talked fancy in her moments, yeah. her final moments. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then, um, so the more we read Penders, the more we'll see glimpses of the future. This seemed to be a fixation of his. Is like, uh, what happens when Sonic becomes an adult and he's no longer restricted by... <laughs> being an underage character what happens then huh <laughs> <laughs> uh, my God. but you can see in this final box here that the editors are kind of undermining uh ken's like future uh perfect future they say wait a minute sonic fans is this really the future of the freedom fighters or just one of the many possible futures of our heroes <laughs> keep reading to find out uh, so th- he's trying to establish a timeline and like a canon and they're like hey this is only one possible future uh, we may be uh, firing this guy <laughs> at some point <laughs> <laughs> oh. oh my god 
I feel like if we could be like, if we could talk to St. Peter and get a copy of the videotape of that he's going to show to Ken Penders when he dies, <laughs> <laughs> and like watch the scenes where he's at the Archie offices, I feel like that's going to be like a Vine cringe comp- compilation. <laughs> like, just be the same exact feelings. Yeah. Uh, the the conversations he must have had with his collaborators and editors as he was penning the story here. All right, more art there. I didn't have much to say about this one. Some cool lasers and stuff. And then ugh, Mirror Zone, a much shorter story with a gimmick that sucks. <laughs> hey, I, I hated this. <laughs> so um, the... Sonic and Tails chase a robot into the mirror zone, which just means everything is printed backwards and you're supposed to read this story in a mirror, which I refuse to do. Yeah, I mean, I was on the couch. I I think the way I kind of thought of this was like with my advanced adult intellect, you know, I'm not as physically capable as I used to be, but I got the big adult brain so I could just read the words on the page and figure out what they said. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Uh, for example, this first bubble here says, "There he is." Yeah, no. Under that, it says, "We've we've got him now." Mm-hmm. This is very easy for me as <laughs> an adult with years of work experience. Um, yeah, you have to read stuff backwards at work a lot. Almost never. Hmm. <laughs> I do think sometimes I I end up reading stuff upside down because I I've passed an important document across my desk to someone and i i'm reading along upside down as they read before they sign it that's basically what'll happen to me it's like maybe there'll be like a lighting plot that i look at i'll be like oh that probably says like 50 degrees or something Mm -hmm. (laughs) i can actually read the backward stuff better than i can read this computer font at the beginning it looks like it says hey sonic fancy yeah that's supposed to be an exclamation point i think yeah, no, it is, but... Yeah, and like the word pers- pursuing in the second line is like... Pois- swing. <laughs> the R looks like an A, kind of. Yeah, it's very hard to read. Yeah, the D looks like an O, so it looks like it says Herdies instead of Heroes. Or yes. Headies. <laughs> well, anyway, they get a computer out of the mirror zone, and then in regular zone... uh it's displayed backwards. And so Rotor has to figure out how to read backwards now, too. They're terrified about never being able to figure it out because, I mean, animals can't read anyway. But sure. um, if they were able to read it, they'd realize that the message is just horseshit anyway. Yeah, this is matter. A, it's a very drinker oval teen moment. Oh, it, yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> the exact way to put that. <laughs> Decode the message so you can read some, like, snow white bullshit anyway mirror zone shitty story and uh ken penders was not involved in that one so archie time to learn your lesson you need ken all right fan art um clearly they were saving some good fan art for their first special issue because look at this yeah this is pretty good you know compared to like what we've had up until now especially i bet ken loved this sally uh yeah like this like mature, very detailed Sally Acorn. I think Brandy here is uh, beginning a personal journey by drawing Perhaps. this. <laughs> Perhaps, yeah. And then page two of the fan art uh, section is a little bit more like what we're used to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah like, just not even about the art, just Bumpus, Virginia. <laughs> 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 uh we've got a chubby knuckles and we got the greaser sonic great drawings from uh well i don't know how old justin norcross is but casper jarvis there was nine years old when he drew greaser sonic and he just generous of ken to let him use his ip <laughs> i know <laughs> ken receives this uh child's drawing in the mail and his his blood pressure rises <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you read the letters i did um it's not that i circled or anything there was 
There's one kid asking if Sonic was going to have a baby named Baby <laughs> Sonic. I love that one. <laughs> and and like if he does, if he doesn't name him Baby Sonic, he's got to name his kid Sonic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah all right let me let me read it, this stuff this is from uh steven quinones i think that was his name yeah from prospect park new jersey uh all right so he asks uh sonic some questions one how old is sally two will you ever marry sally <laughs> three these are his exact words tony already told you about baby sonic but let's let's you got to see the way steven writes this if you marry sally will you ever have a baby named baby sonic Sonic, the reason I'm writing about the third question is because sometimes I'm playing that I have a baby named Sonic, but Baby Sonic can go the speed you can. But if you don't get a baby named Baby Sonic, then you can get a cousin who is just as fast as you, too. Just get a cousin. <laughs> <laughs> Cousins are a great replacement for babies. They're practically <laughs> interchangeable. <laughs> it's like putting margarine in place of butter. Yeah, yeah. I don't have any babies, but I've got a handful of cousins, and they do me just fine. Yeah, same, same. Um, there is another good letter here, too, that I just remembered. I'm not trying to jump away from this, but there is another very good letter. Is it the next one? No, it's not the very next one, though I do like that they ask what a question mark <laughs> is, but there is there is a question mark in their letter. Right. More than um, one, even. This kid, Jason, writes in and says, the, the, like, the last thing he asks is, what, what does this symbol mean? And it's a question mark. And he yeah, has he asked... his question of what a question mark is with a question mark, <laughs> which I, I think maybe the editor helped us out with that one. Yeah. Yeah, maybe this came but in I, with no punctuation in a crayon. But <laughs> that's also weird to me, though, because if they're editing that back in the last letter... You put the pause in there, but we didn't tell the viewers. Let me read the sentence again. If you marry Sally, will you ever have a baby named Baby Sonic? Question mark. Sonic. Period. <laughs> Lowercase t. <laughs> the reason I'm writing you, etc. <laughs> so if they're editing this, why did they edit the one on the right, but not the one on the left? Oh, shit. Uh... Yeah, it's... That's not a comma. No, I, it's supposed it's to be. Yeah, because <laughs> yeah. there's, there's another comic to the bottom left of that. It's very distinct. Yeah, yeah, this is a comma. It's much longer than that dot. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, which letter did you want to talk about, though? It's the one where the little girl gets kink-shamed for being attracted to Robotnik. Yeah. <laughs> It's pretty interesting. This, well, you know, the picture she sent in, uh, you know. Oh, crap. She's, she's an adult. Okay. I actually couldn't see that because um, when I printed this, I my black ink was clogged. So that just came out like a mess. Okay. Um, yeah. I guess she's like an adult. Yeah. This, at least this, like an older teenager. I fucking hope she's an adult because of part of the response she receives. <laughs> uh, this woman named Tammy. Tammy writes in and says that she is attracted to Robotnik and wants to be with him. Um, <laughs> and they write back, well, first, so Sonic is the one responding to these letters. So he says, that's disgusting. I, I'll never tell him about you. <laughs> 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 but then uh, near the end, he says, I'm spoken for, but I think those editor guys, Scott, Paul, and Victor at Archie Comics are single. Why don't you give them a call? Oh, yeah, I didn't put that together at the time. Um, hmm. <laughs> so Scott, Paul, and Victor, uh, did you keep that photo of Tammy up in your office? Yeah, do you, do you keep that one around? <laughs> Are you just sort of like, I guess she's old enough to drive. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know about that one. I guess they don't mention anyone's age in this letters page. Like they I feel did like on they some have of the art. before. Yeah. I feel like they did before. Yeah, I'm very confused about this whole situation. I didn't think about it that much because, again, the picture when I printed it out was just a garbled mess. But like... 
this was fun before you pointed that out. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's still kind of funny, but yeah, I'm very curious about what the situation is there. Yeah, maybe it's like a friend it, of theirs. You that's know, what I was we, about to yeah. say. Maybe this was like set up for that. Right, because what? who would write something like this in to a child's comic book? Especially in the early 90s when like... I feel like people were less emboldened by internet forums. Yes. There was not a uh, Robotnik uh, community yet, which yeah, there is so, for sure now. <laughs> yeah, I feel like back in the day, you'd probably be more likely to be like, I'm the only person who ever thinks this. I'm going to keep it to myself. <laughs> it's weird. Whereas now, like everything, you're just like, oh, that's a weird thing about myself. I'm going to go find a forum. Yeah, I I'll tell you now. I'm in a, a Discord called uh, Eggman Empire, where people post stuff like that. Are you really? Yeah, <laughs> I was trying are to track. Are you not joking? No, that's a real Discord <laughs> channel that I'm in, and I can, can you add me to that? <laughs> yeah, I can. I was like oh, trying yeah, to. Dude. I was trying to hunt down this weird web comic I remembered from like 20 years ago, and it turned out they had an archive of it on this Discord. <laughs> Okay. I believe you held out on me like that. All right, all right. I admit it. That's my complicated cover story. I am physically okay. attracted to Dr. Ivo Robotnik. <laughs> Sick. I mean, you don't have to act ashamed. I'm just like Tammy. I think we all have a bit of Tammy in us. Yeah. All right, there is one last story in this comic. It's uh, Tales Focused. It's called Tales Tallest Tale. But Tale like T-A-L-E. And it's uh, this was written and drawn by Scott Shaw, who you may recall was the artist for the very first Sonic the Hedgehog comic miniseries. So they brought him back for a special Tales adventure, which is about Tales going to a Sonic fan convention and lying to them. So I believe that Sonic's bad behavior is rubbing off on this young man. This innocent young man is being corrupted by his older brother figure. Does Sonic lie? Hmm, good question. I guess he doesn't really. He's actually kind of like brutally honest. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And now and now we get back to that question of like the morality of lying versus telling the truth. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I didn't make that connection between these stories before. Yeah, I think in Tails' case it's pretty immoral because he kind of sets himself up to be um to be like an authority of care. And then when his time comes, he's almost completely unprepared and unqualified. <laughs> yeah. He's, he shows up and they're like, oh, it's time to give your speech for our Sonic convention. And he's like, speech? Oh, uh oh. Uh, and then he lies to them and tells them that he fought a big frog robot. He's, tr he's just trying to impress them. Mm. Uh, but before he finishes the frog robot story, uh, Dr. Ivo Robotnik arrives in some weird kind of mech suit that I haven't seen before. Yeah, it's an interesting one. You may have noticed that I've been putting a lot of emphasis on the name Ivo Robotnik. And I'm doing that intentionally because they say his full name multiple times in this issue. And I think it was intentional. Like they're trying to really put that information in the reader's head. His first name is Ivo and don't you forget it. <laughs> yeah, I, keep, I forget the genesis of the of the Robotnik names. Because was there a point where like this canon kind of diverged with other canons? I think so. I don't know that there's been a coherent like single canon for Sonic ever. <laughs> yeah, I, it's kind of fucked up because I'm trying to think if this is a conversation we had or if I watched it in like. <laughs> a YouTube video about weird people who are into Sonic. But I do remember <laughs> something coming up where someone was mad about the distinction between like Eggman mm -hmm. and Ivo Robotnik. And I think it was kind of like, a, not like a Sunni Shia divide, but like, <laughs> oh, if you're one of those fucking like Ivo people, like get the fuck out of my face yeah. or whatever. Yeah. Well, I know that in Japan, he's like always been Eggman. And then I think so, yeah. for his American introduction, they came up with the Robotnik, which I guess is a more 
American sounding evil genius name. Eggman is just too silly mm. for for Western audiences. Um, yeah. And then, uh, do you remember Gerald Robotnik? I think that's like Eggman's grandfather who created Shadow. Oh yeah, and then he gets like tortured and killed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then I, I think, think his, name his was daughter or something. Maria. Was it? Was yeah? Was Maria like his daughter, and then she like dies, like crashes into the earth in like a space station or something? Yeah, something like that. Is yeah. Maria like? Robotnik's mom? I don't fucking remember. She <laughs> died young. Yeah. I know that. Oh, true. Yeah, she couldn't have had him already. I don't think. Anyway. <laughs> Play Sonic Adventure 2 if you don't know what we're talking about. Probably the deepest lore of the Sonic games. Well, that's not true. I, I haven't played any of them in like the last 15 years, so I don't know about the lore. <laughs> yeah, me neither. There's a lot of them. Frontiers is supposed to be like sad, I guess, which is pretty funny. <laughs> All right, uh, I wanted to point out this like family circus type shit at the bottom of this page. Uh, Tails gets whapped around by this mech suit, and it it tells you to follow the numbers to view Tails' flight path. So he's like bouncing around between these trees, and it shows you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven to follow the follow the path like you follow a little Jeffy around the neighborhood. But what I thought was very funny was. Uh, the numbers that you're supposed to be following his path look pretty much the same as this page number here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so you go one through seven, and then uh, number 45 over there. But it's the last one you want to look at still, so it still, still follows. Mm -hmm. You just don't see steps eight through 44. Those happened off panel. Uh, have we got to the come yet? No, the cum's right now. We're, we're talking about the cum right now. I don't know if you want to set this up. I was just going to go for it, just kind of get it out of the way. Yeah. Um, do you want to set it up, or should I just... All right, well, the, so the Sonic invention, there's a bunch of like little animals that look up to Sonic, is the whole thing. And uh, they're now fighting Robotnik in a mech suit, and one of the little animals is Posey. She is a possum. Possum. Yeah. Possum, yeah. as established in the next moments here, where mm. she confronts the big mech suit. And, um, yeah, what, uh, Robotnik is, you know, doing his, his banter and threatening her. And uh, how does he threaten her? All right, so she gets up underneath uh, Robotnik's robot, which, if you're not watching, it, it has big feet. And his foot's, like, positioned, like, over her, and she's, like, yelling at Robotnik. She's like, hey, Robotnik, fuck you, you can't do shit. Suck my dick, Robotnik. <laughs> and Robotnik's like, oh, you have spunk, huh? Do you know what spunk is? Mm. And, you know, I read this at first. I'm like, oh, it's... Of course, I'm going to think about cum. But, like, I'm like, yeah, spunk means something else, too. But then in the next panel, he said... He completes his thought. He says, it's the gooey possum-colored stuff that's going to be stuck <laughs> to the bottom of my giant robot toes. <laughs> It's going to be stuck to my toes. A uh, possum, if you don't know at home, they tend to be kind of whitish gray. <laughs> um, Posey in this comic is like entirely gray, kind of like a mm -hmm. bluish gray. Um, I would notice, I don't know if it's the case in this, a lot of the times the colorist is a separate person. Yes. From yes. like the writer and the penciler and all that. Maybe they were doing damage control. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we do not make a single pixel of this cre creature white or this spunk <laughs> joke is gonna go way too far <laughs> it's gonna land way too hard um but yeah it's gonna be in his toes um my god which again yeah laying seeds for the future um seeds ha, 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 ha. <laughs> <laughs> i mean just the word gooey Gooey, yeah, that's what did it for me. Like yeah. when I first read it, I'm just sort of like, all right, yeah, I've been fucked up by the internet. Like I'm just ruined. Oh yeah, yeah spunk. It means cum. Okay, whatever. That's just me. Um, <laughs> no, I don't think it was. Well, um, e even if you, even if you pretend you don't know that spunk means cum, this moment is like very dark for what this story calls for. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it is. It it is, and also now that I think of it. 
if you don't know Spunk has come, then how does that statement make sense? Yeah, I mean, he's going to smash this little girl possum into goo. He's just uh, going to pulverize her <laughs> into a bloody roadkill mess. Do you know what courage is? It's I'm just going to turn you into fucking paste. That's what courage is. <laughs> it's, it, it's, a, it's a fucking creature that used to have a family and friends and thoughts and feelings and ambitions. And now it's just fucking white goo being smashed through my toes. Yeah. And these characters are, they're characterized as like children too. Like they're like, they're kind of like obsessive fans of Sonic the Hedgehog. They are a stand in for the readers of this comic book. Yeah. These are, (laughs) these are young, (laughs) young people who look up to Sonic the Hedgehog and the, the villain is saying, I am going to brutally and bloodily murder you on the pages of this book you're reading. And the pages are going to get stuck together. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> All right, yeah, we're moving on from come. <laughs> yeah, those, those, those two panels were a lot. I was trying not to get too hung up on the come because you know me, I'm always getting hung up on come. <laughs> That's right. And this happens on the second to last page. So we're almost done. And the, yeah. it took us this long to get to the come. All right, really the last thing that happens here is Tails comes up with an ingenious way of defeating his enemy. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the, the physics here are amazing. So, you know, he uses his two tails to fly. Everyone knows that. So what if he's flying, his do- he's doing his helicopter technique. I'll just read his thought bubble there. Now, if I can just hold both of my tails stationary while letting my body rotate instead... <laughs> so he like transfers the motion from his tails to the rest of his body somehow he's able to do that yeah it's it's an interesting physical proposition because his hands are what's anchoring him to gravity i think i don't know if that's lead force like (laughs) i don't know why so i'm going through like I'm not going to try to make this work. <laughs> <laughs> so I wish they would show it. I wish they would show him spinning while his tails are sitting still in midair. Right. We only see him from the front when the rest of him starts spinning. Uh, so th- think about it like a helicopter. The blades are spinning on a helicopter and that's what keeps it in the air. Now imagine you are able to suddenly grab the blades and hold them still. That, that, that's exactly it. That's yeah, exactly, that, and I feel like that's even kind of plausible if you have the right equipment. But his tails are like in the middle of the air, so it's not like you're grabbing the rotors on the helicopter. Mm-hmm. It's yeah. like if the helicopter was like spinning, <laughs> the cockpit was just spinning. <laughs> and that's what was keeping it in the air. Right. <laughs> he does it with <laughs> just the strength of his own body. He is able to suddenly stop his tails. And then the force of that spinning is then transferred into the rest of him. But but when you see it here, the like the center of the spinning seems to be his feet, not his butt, where his tails are. Yeah, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, that's exactly what they're doing. This is really a much more complicated twist on Sonic's classic move of running in a circle. It is it is in a way kind of more maybe more efficient at the end of the day i feel like mm-hmm. sonic needs more floor space to make it work right tails is able to just do this at one spot in the air somehow yeah and it's such, if, it, sorry it, i was it, gonna say if <laughs> tails could turn himself into like a wheel like kirby can that might make <laughs> him faster than sonic eventually yeah yeah uh and and this site is so i mean imagine if you were seeing this it just breaks your reality to witness somebody like seemingly breaking scientific law right in front of you and it just breaks robotnik's brains he gets dizzy his eyes turn into swirls and that is how he is then defeated which again is is a a technique that Sonic has used many times. Make your enemies dizzy, and you win. Yep. 
I feel like Tails got a decent amount of character development in this entire issue. Pulled out a sword and he spun. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's character development, if you ask me. <laughs> Honestly, I think he got the most development in this issue. Like, there are a lot of pages for Sally, but I don't think anything really happened. I don't know what the fuck was going on with that, but yeah, we I did skip part know. two. Maybe we... There's some yeah, things not know. connecting for us. Uh, yeah. He also... Um, Tails also got kissed by a possum. He did. Right at the end. Pretty cool for him. A nice moment for our little guy. Well, that was Sonic in Your Face, the first special of the Archie Comics Sonic the Hedgehog series. And this is exactly what you wanted to listen to, person who hit play on this episode of Rock Hard Caucus. And uh, if if you enjoyed that, there are eight previous episodes in the Speed Freak Read Speak series, which you can find at patreon.com slash rockhardcaucus. Thank you. Thank you to anyone who... Perhaps we didn't get the best of footing at first. Um, I'm sure after listening to this episode and seeing the trials and tribulations of the characters therein, um, if a fox can be kissed by a possum, you know, any two people can learn to rec- reconcile and get along. Absolutely. Past their differences. Yeah. Yeah. This has all been about putting aside differences, burying the hatchet, things like that. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I was actually playing Assassin's Creed 3, and he buried the hatchet as a sign of war, and then unburying oh. the hatchet meant, like, the war was over. Interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so, uh, little plug to Assassin's Creed 3, honestly, I don't necessarily recommend you play it. It's kind of whatever. Um, I've never played yeah. any of those games, but learning that they sort of do, like, a like an oppositional symbolism thing like that is intriguing. I I wonder if it's one of those things where the symbolism got fucked up somewhere along the way, like with the bootstraps and the blood of the covenant, water of the womb type thing. <laughs> I haven't looked it up. I'm going to, but I'm going to do it off episode. Mm-hmm. Um, Tune in next time if you want to <laughs> hope I remembered that I looked that up. I might tell you. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Tony. Uh, I think we got a lot out of that one. Yeah, I feel good about it. Um, we still went an hour 20 minutes, even though it was one episode. Or, yeah, one comic. Hell yeah. Yeah. Well, it was a giant size 48 page issue, so. It was very long, yeah. Yeah. All right. The end. Bye, everybody.